All right. Okay. Um, good morning. It's, it's really um, good to be here. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm only here for a, a couple of days, but when um, I was asked to come along and do this, um, it was something I was really pleased to do. I've been to South Africa before, and I must say that I love the country, and um, one of my ambitions really is to um, launch the brand um, over here uh, at, at some stage. Um, what I normally do at this time, really, is to go and sort of tell you a bit about my backstory and how the brand was really developed. But what I'm going to do, because I'm probably aware that you haven't got a clue what the brand looks like, um, this is what we do. So um, if you go to any of the major supermarkets um, in, the, in the UK, you'll be able to buy um, Black Farmer sausages. So we, do, we started off with sausages. Um, we also do meatballs. What you'll see here, and I'll, and I'll explain how we ha also have a sub-brand called the Black Farmer's Daughter. And um, we also do um, pork and beef burgers there, and we've, we, we sort of do chicken. So I just wanted to show you those pictures first of all, because as a rule, I don't particularly like having slides going when I'm doing my talk, because I like people to sort of focus on me. So that gives you an idea of what, what, what the brand looks like. And as you could see, the whole idea when I launched this brand was for it to be a premium-looking brand. It's not an ethnic brand. It's a brand that was specifically aimed at the mainstream. And so the idea of having a brand called The Black Farmer aimed at the mainstream, and what I mean by aimed at the mainstream is that actually my consumers are white, middle-class people. It really is, is taking an idea and turning it totally on its head. And I'll tell you how I, I did that um, in a moment. So if I go all the way back to the beginning, to just again to tell you about my sort of backstory and how this brand came about, was that um, I was born in Jamaica, as was indicated earlier on in the intro, and I was born in a place called Clarendon Frankfield, for those of you who don't know the island. And if you went there today, you'd see that um, it's quite a rural part of J Jamaica, and you see quite a lot of subsistence farmers who actually work the land. Now, some of you might know the, the UK's history, but during the 1950s, people like my parents had the opportunity um, to go to the UK, and obviously because um, Jamaica is one of the developing nations, a lot of people decided to leave Jamaica to go to the, the, the UK to better their lives and the lives of their, their children. And I've always said to people, actually, that is quite an entrepreneurial thing to do. To leave your country of origin, to go to another country, is a very entrepreneurial thing to do. My parents, they moved to um, a, a part of the UK called Birmingham. Now, if you're from the, the, um, the UK, you'll know that Birmingham is a bit of a shithole, basically. So, you know, um, <laughs> sorry if I offend anybody here from sort of Birmingham, but it's not one of those places you, you, you should be proud of coming from. And... Um, it was one of those, um, the part of Birmingham that I'm from really is one of those classic inner city areas that's really devoid of hope, devoid of opportunity. It's a pretty awful place to be, in, uh, to be brought up. And um, I'm from a family of 11. I've got eight brothers and sisters and my parents are brought up. My parents lived in one of these areas of Birmingham which is very, very poor. Now, as a way of subsidizing the, the, the family income, my, um, my father had an allotment, and I don't know if you actually know what the term allotment means over here, but it's, a sort of, it's, a, it's an urban site where you have a small patch of land, and there you can actually grow your own sort of um, fruit, fruit and vegetables. And as the eldest boy, it was my responsibility to look after this allotment. And I absolutely loved being on this allotment. So you can imagine that in this urban setting, you have this allotment which is, for me, was like a real oasis away from the sort of poverty that I was surrounded by. So when I go around and I do these talks generally, generally to young people, this is one of the important bits that I tell them, is that I can remember at the age of 11 that I made myself a promise that one day I would like to buy my own farm. Now, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but it was a promise that I'd lodged into the back of my mind and then everything that I subsequently did was to try and get into position to buy a farm. Now, I don't know whether it's the same over here, but in the UK, the people who tend to own farms tend to be white people who've had it handed down from generation to generation. So to, to have the idea of buying your own farm, coming from nothing, it's, it's a mighty challenge. But it was a, a dream that I lodged in the back of my mind, and that is what I wanted to do. 
Anyhow, I went to, um, in, in Birmingham, again, I don't know if you understand this term, but I went to the local secondary modern school in Birmingham, and secondary modern schools, basically, they're shit schools, basically. That's where everybody who don't have any, anything about them tend to go to those particular schools. So it was, the, the school that I went to was as much as, much as an awful place as where I sort of brought up. Anyhow, I left school at 16, and I left at 16 without any qualifications. I could sort of hardly read and write. I'm, I've got, I don't know if you understand what dyslexia is here, but I've got um, dyslexia, which means that you find the way of learning a bit different. But also, what's very interesting is that a lot of entrepreneurs tend to be dyslexic. It's very interesting that when you go around and you talk to entrepreneurs, a lot of them have some form of dyslexia. So I left school at 16. Um, I wanted to get away from home, so I joined the army, but um, unfortunately I got kicked out of the army because in England there's one thing being um, a loudmouth um, git, being a black loudmouth git meant you were going to get your head kicked in. So um, I, I got my head kicked in and I got kicked out of the army. So I have a dishonorable discharge to my name. So you could see that um, I'm only about sort of 17 at the moment and everything that everybody would have sort of predicted would have, that would happen to a young black kid from the inner cities, I seem to be going down that particular road. In those days, actually, if you were a failure at everything, there was then only one option available to you. And believe it or not, that option was catering. So I went into um, to become a chef, and this was the days before chefing was a glamorous profession. And luckily, I liked that, and I, and I worked in um, various hotels and, and, and restaurants in the UK. But what was very interesting is that as much as I loved doing that, the promise that I'd made to myself to buy my farm was something that was always, always nagging at me. And I just knew that I had to try and better myself so I could get in the position to buy this farm. That's not it would never happen. In those days, there used to be a brilliant um, television series on the BBC called 40 Minutes. They made, they made social documentaries about people's lives. And I loved that program so much that I decided that I would like to go and work in television um, as a producer-director. So you can imagine that when I told my family and friends that I would like to go and work in television, they just thought I was nuts because A, I could hardly read and write. B, television is very, very much the sort of profession for the Oxbridge types, those who've been to Oxford and Cambridge, and they thought I was nuts. But I remember something that my father had said to me, and I've tried to live my life on these principles, and they've absolutely always worked for me, always, always worked. And these principles are these. That actually, you only need two things in life to achieve anything that you want. I fundamentally believe this, you only need two things. And anyone who is successful have these two things. The first thing is to have absolute focus, ruthless focusness. So you will see it in your great athletes, you will see it in very, very successful business, they're absolutely focused. And when you're focused, it means that you don't really get caught up with all the things um, on the outside. And the other thing is to have a positive attitude, because by having a positive attitude, you will then have people will come your way to help you achieve the things that you want to achieve in life. And you never really achieve it on your own. You need other people to help you on your journey. So taking those words of advice, I decided that I would write to everybody I could who worked in television. I didn't care whether they were a producer, a director, a security guard, anything that I could to try and get me a break. And after a couple of years, I did. Somebody was kind enough to introduce me to a chap at the, at the BBC. He gave me a break just as a general runner around. And then from that, I worked as a researcher, went on to be a producer, director, and um, I then spent 10 years at the BBC making food and drink programs. So in the UK, there's a program called the Food and Drink Program, which was a very, very famous program. And I was a producer director of that program. And I traveled the world. And one of the reasons I was in South Africa many years ago is that I came to do films about the, the wines um, of South Africa. And so that's why I know this country a bit. So I was at the BBC for 10 years, loved it every minute of it. But again, the promise that I'd made to myself to buy my farm was really, really getting to the point that I knew that if I didn't do it at that moment, I would never really do it again. So I decided that I was going to leave the BBC and set up my own company. Now, um, the, obviously, my experience to date had 
always been in food. So obviously I worked as a chef. I spent a number of years making food programs. So I decided that what I would do is that I would set up my own food and drink marketing agency. And um, because that obviously was my sort of um, skill base. And let's tell you something, and those of you who have started your own business will know what I'm talking about here. Is that I can remember that when I decided to start up my own business, I only had enough money to pay my mortgage for three months. And what is really interesting is that everybody in this room will have dreams of things that they would love to do. They would absolutely love to do. And there's one thing that stops them from doing it. And I don't know whether you're going to identify yourselves as this person, but there's one thing that stops them from doing it, and that thing is fear. It's amazing how fear really stops people from chasing their dreams. And I say to people this, actually, there's only one antidote that I know to fear, and that antidote is passion. So whatever you do, you've got to make sure that you're passionate about it because it's a passion that drives you through all the hurdles that will come your way. It's a bit like falling in love. You actually got to trust that what you do is going to work. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, and a lot about the relationship with the consumer, is about like falling in love. You've got to trust that what you're doing is the right thing, because for a long time, there's no evidence that what you're doing is paying off. You just have to trust that it is. And so I really, really believe that. So you've got to trust that it's going to work for you. Anyhow, I started my business, and it was quite important, this business, this marketing agency, because this marketing agency taught me about the importance of the consumer. Is that if you know how to communicate with the consumer, if you know that the power of that relationship with the consumer is going to make the difference between your, your, the success in your business or not, that is critical. And all too often, businesses do not, they do not spend the sorts of money that you need to spend to have that relationship with the consumer because people get bogged down with the doing. When you're actually communicating with the consumer, <coughs> it's getting out of the doing and understanding that the energy that you've got to give to this consumer is very, very important. Now, the sort of um, businesses that I actually marketed in the UK, they were quite entrepreneurial businesses. They were businesses that were going in and they were going to really revolutionize um, a category. Now, all too often, when people talk about marketing, they talk about advertising. So you go to a marketing director, and he wants to advertise. And the reason why he wants to advertise is because actually it's measurable. Everybody wants a bloody measure of things, so it's measurable. He could go to his gaffer and say, look at my sexy little ad, and this is a sort of measurement, okay? If you are really wanting to cons uh, communicate with the consumer, what I fundamentally believe in, and this brand here, the Black Farmer brand, which is, by the way, Britain's number one super premium sausage brand in the country. We have never, ever spent a penny on advertising, above-the-line marketing. We've never, ever spent a penny on it. All of our marketing has been what they call below the line in terms of everything we've done. It's about how do we create the word of mouth rather than advertising. Because I don't need to tell you this, that actually a consumer, the consumer is more likely to believe something that they hear from their friends rather than something that is advertised. Because the moment that they actually could go and tell something about it, a discovery brand, this is a classic discovery brand, it has a lot more power. So every one of those brands that I worked with when I was running my marketing agency, all we specialized in was below-the-line activity. Now, one of the reasons why we specialized in below-the-line activities, actually, they didn't have enough money to do it above the line, which was a good thing, because the trouble is, all too often, when people have a lot of money, they go straight to above the line, when actually, in the early days, that's the worst possible thing you could do. And it's about trying to get the discipline of doing below the line. Now, the sort of brands that we worked on is a brand called Lloyd Grossman Sources. Now, what Lloyd wanted to do was that he wanted to revolutionize the source category. He wanted to do something pretty simple, which is that what a lot of manufacturers do when they're making sauces is that when you're making a sauce in the, at home, you will have a ring of oil that comes on the top. So 
the, the, the wisdom of the, of the day was that what you need to do is to put emulsifiers in to actually get rid of that ring of oil. Lloyd said, no. What you want to do is that you want to keep that because, A, it was, it's our point of difference, and this is what it should look like. So what you then got to do is that you've got to communicate that to the consumer, that actually don't be frightened about this ring of oil. Actually, that ring of oil is proof that it's a quality product. So advertising and telling people that would never, ever work. It's about going around, going and explaining that laborious stuff of going around doing samplings and explaining to people that's what it was about is a, is a critical thing that we had to do. In the UK, another brand that we were responsible for was a brand called Kettle Chips. Again, Kettle Chips revolution, re revolutionized the idea that actually most crisps at that time were these sort of um, mushy manufactured stuff, but they said no. A crisp should be a potato which is sliced and fried. That was a revolutionary concept in the UK. And again, what we had to do was to go around and communicate with the consumer what was sort of going on. Lots of below the line activity. So that experience that I had running my marketing agency was quite critical to when I came to launch my own brand. And what was very interesting about now and then, in those days when I was working on those brands, the internet wasn't as big as it is now. We did not have social media. And so the only way of doing below the line activity was through journalists and having good relationships with, with editorial. In those days, what you wanted to do is that you wanted to try and get um, journalists writing about it because it, editorial had more value than advertising. One of the great things that happened to me with my brand was that actually the internet explosion had happened just at the time when I'd launched my brand, which it then meant that all that below-the-line activity that I'm talking about was a much cheaper thing to do than actually spending all that money sort of whining and dining journalists. And, you know, you had no control of what the journalists would or would not write. The internet made it a lot easier to do um, below-the-line activity. Anyhow, having run my marketing agency, I then had enough money to buy my farm. And I decided that what I would do is that I'd buy my farm um, down in, in Devon. So it's on the Devon-Cornwall border. And it was a farm that had been in the family for about 200 years. And um, for those of you who know anything about farming, in the UK, farmers were really, really struggling. And they were desperate to sort of get rid of it. So obviously, I bought this farm. And then I went about sort of investing money into it. Now, <coughs> when I moved to that part of the UK, what I saw really surprised me. Believe it or not, unlike perhaps in this country and, and the rest of the Europe, there's this massive gulf between rural and urban Britain. It's as though you're going into two different countries, is that actually the people who produce our food, that the urban consumer, who are the ones with the power, have absolutely no relationship with them at all, and they think farmers are just really very odd people. And I just saw that as an opportunity. Now, what I've always believed is this, is that it's outsiders who bring about change. Because they're the ones who say, well, who says that this has to be the way that things are done? And people who are on the inside are the ones who want to keep the status quo. So part of challenging and bringing something new is always about having the thinking of the outsider. So I went into this community. I saw that all these food producers had no relationship at all with the British consumer, that actually the people who had the relationship with the supermarkets, and the supermarkets understood the power of the consumer. And in the UK, and it might be the, question, the same thing here, is that the only people that the supermarkets fear are the consumers. And that if you're a business, if you're a brand, and you understand that fundamental rule, that what you have to do is get the consumer on side, and if you get them on side, you then have power, that is what I realized when I decided I was going to launch my own brand. So I just saw that all these farmers were missing out on an opportunity, that actually there was a real change happening sort of globally, and that what consumers were really wanting to do was they were looking to have a relationship with a real person. We all know about the, the, the global recession, and in the past, what happened was that people used to look at big institutions and big corporates where they had their faith in. So if you work for a big corporate, you felt as though you'd made it. 
if you had your money in a big institution, you felt protected. The big global crisis has changed that, is that people no longer feel as safe with these big entities as they did in the past. So there's a real search for real people, as, as we call it. And any business, any brand that identifies that that is what the consumer is looking for are the brands that are going to succeed in the future. So I say to people now, this is a great time to actually to launch um, profiled brands of a real person because that really means that you're going to be succeeding in the future. Anyhow, I decided that what I wanted to do was that I wanted to launch my own brand and I wanted to launch a brand that was going to be very, very different. And I thought, well, what product could I do? Now, believe it or not, the things that the British love is that they love their English breakfast. And I know that when I used to go abroad and I used to come back, the one thing I used to love is my English breakfast. And at the heart of this English breakfast is a sausage. They love their sausages in the UK. And at the time, most of the sausages on the market were pretty disgusting. Because what butchers traditionally used to do is that they used to put all the fag end of the bloody pig into this, into some skin with breadcrumbs and sell it as a sausage, and they were pretty disgusting things. So I decided that what I was going to do was that I'm going to do a very high premium sausage that was going to be at a competitive price with the major multiples because they had their, their, their range as well. And I knew that actually... It was no good just coming up with a sausage because people are going to think, well, you know, why is yours any different to anyone else's? Um, at the time, I did some research that said that one in a hundred people actually suffer from some sort of wheat intolerance, celiac disease, or they can't, they've got a gluten intolerance. So I thought, I'll make all of my products um, gluten-free. And um, not only that, um, it's, it's to have a high-quality sausage that was really gluten-free. So I, I did a lot of research and I got the sausage. The next thing was coming up with the brand name. Now, a lot of companies spend millions trying to figure out what is going to be the right brand name for their product. Now, um, in the UK, and probably the same in, in, in South Africa, there is a real sensitivity about what is the correct language you should use when you're referring to people. And so people just, they, they really sort of dance around that sort of issue. And sort of white people especially are really nervous about, well, what is the correct sort of language you should use when you're referring to people of color? So I thought, well, shit, you know, this is a good idea, this is. So in, um, in, the, in the UK, down on my farm in Devon, all of my friend, all of my farm and community used to call me the black farmer. Now, that is seen, to, that comes across as being in not politically correct. So, there's, you know, they think calling someone a black farmer is not the sort of thing to do. And I just thought, well, shit, you know, that's a bloody good brand name. Not only is it um, a really good brand name, no one else in the country could use that. And not, only <laughs> <laughs> and not only could no one else use that, but it has what they call jeopardy. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by jeopardy, is that if you're reading a great book, or you're watching a great film, the thing that keeps you interested, the thing that stimulates you, is, well, what's going to happen next? And so having a brand called a black farmer, with all this nervousness around calling people black farmers, has a lot of jeopardy to it, because people look at it and they go, whoa, they're not too sure about whether that's the politically correct thing to do. And there is a slight nervousness about whether you should do it. Now, I, what under things I understand when you're trying to engage with the consumer is that how do you make that emotional engagement? Because that emotional engagement is critical. If you could get them to feel something, they're then engaged. They then want to actually find out a bit more. So if you have a brand called a black farmer, people look at it and they go, whoa, what is all this about? You know, it, it, it just it surprises them because A, People start thinking black farmer, what black farmer in Devon, because it's so outside the norm or outside what is expected, it causes some sort of emotional interaction. And that is what I wanted to do. In fact, all I wanted to do was to copy the Richard Branson scenario. Believe it or not, when Richard Branson launched the Virgin brand, using the word virgin in public was a very risky not political correct thing to do. 
And you'd never believe that today with the brand being such a global brand, but it was the same strategy. Somebody was breaking the rules. Somebody was challenging the perception of what is feasible. And that is what I wanted to do with the black farmer, is that I wanted to have a brand that was aimed specifically at the mainstream, that was challenging the whole concept about what is the correct language that you could use. I can remember when I first launched this brand, somebody reported me, they have a commission in the UK called the Racial Equality to Commi Commission, which is to look at you know, um, racism and all that. And somebody complained about you know, this black farmer brand. And I said, well, shit, you know, I'm black, I'm a farmer. What do you want to call me, the Afro-Caribbean farmer? It doesn't, have the <laughs> it doesn't have the same sort of ring about it. So that was the, that was the strategy in, in, in launching that brand. The brand was also launched to be an international brand, and that's why, rather than put my face on it, it's a, that's a silhouette of me in the background, and it's a brand that we wanted to launch in America, in Canada. You know, I want to launch this brand in the deep South of America. Shit's going to hit the fan there, basically, where there is that, all that big sensitivity about you know, what you can't say and all that sort of stuff. South Africa, again, it, it's, it's one of these brands I think that could work extremely well in South Africa because the notion of a black farmer being premium is just wouldn't be seen, it just wouldn't sort of compute. And that is what the brand's all about. It's actually turning those old ideas on its head and actually putting a totally different sort of perspective. So it'd be interesting to see whether it would work here or not. Now, having developed the brand, the next idea was to get it actually listed in the supermarkets. And um, when I went to all of the supermarkets, they all said no. Supermarkets are like everywhere else around the bloody world. They're lazy little gits, basically. And um, I knew, as I said it before, that actually the only people they would respect and fear is a consumer. So I decided that I would travel the whole country, and this is true, travel the whole country, and I would give out free samples. And again, what I said earlier on about the power of the internet is that I'd, I built a website, and when I built a website, I put all of the buyers, um, of supermarket buyers, telephone numbers, names, addresses on this website. And as I went around the country doing samples, I would simply say to people, if you really like the sausage, I just want you to do me one favor, just go onto my website and demand that the buyer list my products. And as God is my witness, that's how I got my products actually in the supermarkets, the consumer. I was amazed at the power, because if you have the consumer that's bought something that they like, that actually for years they've been trying to get something which they could feed themselves and then they find something, you have an army of people who were there fighting your corner, absolutely fighting your corner. And so I'm really grateful to the consumer. So as a business, we spend a lot of money actually looking after our consumer because we treat our consumer as our sales force. And that you've got to really look after your sales force for them to actually help build your business. And um, in the last five years, what has happened previously, a lot of businesses, all they did was that they build a website and then they thought that was it. That ain't the case now in terms of you want to communicate with your consumer. Is that um, websites is where people go for information. For relationships, people go to social networking sites. So they go to Twitter, they go to Facebook. And so what I would like you all to do at some stage um, over the next few days is to go onto my Facebook page and to go onto Twitter and you'll see the relationship, the interaction that is happening on our, on, on our social networking. And um, what is interesting about social networking is this, is that I never ever, or very, very rarely, say anything about my products on when I'm interacting on, uh, on Facebook or Twitter. Never ever. I will talk about the bloody dog, I'll talk about the weather, I'll talk about, I'll talk, I mean, I'll tell them that I'm here in South Africa, I'll tell them about my life. And that is what people want. In fact, I'll get more bloody um, interaction going on when I'm talking about the dogs and when I'm talking about the product. The moment that you start talking about your products all the time, people think you're selling to them. And social networking is not about selling to people. It's about interacting with them. It's about having the relationship. And what is absolutely fascinating is that I never, ever have to mention my products at all. Somebody will always be there saying, I had your sausages um, tonight. I'm going to buy your sausages today. And that is what I want. They're talking about my products. I'm not saying a thing about it. 
So that, for me, is a critical thing. People make the mistake of thinking that what you need to do is use social networking to be te flogging your product. They don't like it, and they will sort of leave in their sort of drones. They're looking to have some sort of relationship. One of the things I say to companies is this, is that what you should do symbolically is that every time you have a board meeting, you should get an empty chair, you should stick it there, and that empty chair is the consumer because the consumer now expects to be in the boardroom. They expect to know what sort of going on. And the companies that understand that are the ones who are really going to do well in the future. So a lot of my time is spent doing all of that below the line activity. People ask me, how much time do I spend on my farm? I don't really spend that much time on my farm. My job is to go around marketing my brand, communicating. I am the face of the brand. I am the black farmer, so I've got to be out there actually creating that sort of relationship. Now, <laughs> the other sort of things that we do when we, on our social networking is that people want to have some reason to um, link with you, to communicate with you. So we will give away, I've done a cookbook. There's a black farmer cookbook. Actually, I should have brought some with me here and given some away. But there's a black farmer cookbook, which every week we'll have a competition where somebody could win this sort of cookbook. We, on my farm, we'll ha we, we have barns where people could come and stay, so we do holidays where people could actually come and stay at, at, at the Black Farmer Farm. We'll do little sort of competitions where people could always get something from the, the Black Farmer. Now, just again to tell you about the power of social networking and never to underestimate it and how the big companies see how powerful it is, um, I've had the big retailers, people like Tesco's, you have a new buyer, who decides, actually, they want to delist you. They decide, for whatever reason, they're going to delist you and put, some, put um, somebody else in their place. So all I did was put it on my Facebook page, and the shit hit the fan, basically. <laughs> <laughs> because what you have is that you've got all these loyal consumers you know, who've got this relationship with you that have this big corporate who's going to take away their friend, and they go to war. They really go to war for you. And again, that is what to, is to understand, is that when you've got these consumers who feel that it is their brand, in a sense, that they've invested emotionally into this brand, they will do anything against big corporates or big entities that dare to do something to this small black farmer struggling away. They will actually go there and fight your sort of corner. That is why we invest so much time and so much money looking after the consumer. So I shall finish now because I'm, I, I know that uh, there's a lot of speakers to go. So thank you very much for, for, for listening to me and um, um, I look forward to some questions later on. Thank you.